Welcome to the Health Leader Forge, a joint production between the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. My name is Mark Bonica, and I am an assistant professor in the University of New Hampshire's Department of Health Management and Policy. Today's guest is Lieutenant Colonel Amy Thompson, the division surgeon for the 101st Airborne Division. The 101st Airborne Division is one of the Army's most storied units, having played critical roles during World War II on D-Day, the Battle of the Bulge, and other history-changing moments. The 101st is currently located at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, but its units are deployed all around the world. Lieutenant Colonel Thompson is a board-certified pediatrician with a fellowship in adolescent medicine focused on young adults. As she notes in the podcast, more than half of the Army is under the age of 25, so her specialty is actually perfect for her mission of taking care of soldiers. As you listen to Lieutenant Colonel Thompson's story, I think you'll be struck by the level of commitment she has demonstrated to her mission of taking care of soldiers, repeatedly volunteering to serve in challenging and dangerous environments when she could easily choose to remain in a hospital or a clinic. In the podcast, the themes of mission, service, and endurance repeat, and we conclude with a discussion of servant leadership. I hope you enjoy listening to Lieutenant Colonel Thompson's story, and if you find it valuable, won't you leave us feedback on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or wherever you may be accessing this recording. It helps other people discover us. Thanks for listening, and here is Lieutenant Colonel Amy Thompson. Welcome to the podcast, Amy. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So you went to the University of California at Berkeley and you majored in biology. Uh, Mm -hmm. What brought you to Berkeley and why biology? Well, I think uh, for me, I was, I was, you know, grew up in Redwood City, California, which is about 45 minutes outside of San Francisco, Oakland, kind of Berkeley, the Bay Area there. And uh, um, I was more of a homebody. So I kind of knew I didn't want to go too far away from home. But uh, I got accepted to UC Berkeley, and uh, you know the the idea of a, a big school like that was just very exciting to me. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's where I ended up going. You know, I could still come home on the weekends if I wanted, but was far enough away to pursue my studies and nice and kind of move forward. So right. it, was, it was exciting. Yeah. So it was hometown, kind of or near near uh-huh. enough. All right. And yep. biology? Were you already thinking medicine or? Yeah. I was already thinking medicine. I think I kind of went into college thinking I'm going to go for pre-med. And so I started out my freshman year actually running cross country because that was one of my other goals was to see if I could be a D1 athlete. Okay. And so I uh, started out, walked onto the cross country team and uh, did a year of cross country and track at Berkeley while basically pursuing pre-med and started out in biology. And it was it was much more challenging than I expected. And after my first year, I basically uh, had to step back from cross country okay. uh, and continue on the pre med journey. But yeah, it was it was it was a challenging first year for me. Yeah. So the cross country was more challenging, or the schoolwork was more challenging. Which way was it? I think it was all of the above, all and the probably above. <laughs> and being being away from home for my first year. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I, I improved I improved my times tremendously. I think I was running a five minute mile and a 10 minute, 45 second, two mile, you know, and keeping up with everybody and competing all over the, the Bay area and the state uh, for cross country. But then at the same time, I I got a D in calculus my first semester. Oh, ouch. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, I was like, I think my, my balance was off, you know, and I was just a walk on to the cross country team and track team. I wasn't on a scholarship or anything. So at the end of my first year, uh, I had to really reassess my priorities. And so I, yeah, so I was just like, you know what? I was stressed about my GPA and I I knew like long-term I wanted to go into medicine. And I knew also like I wasn't going to get a scholarship for cross country or track. It was more of just a passion that Mm -hmm. I was pursuing, but I felt like, okay, I, I did it. You know, that's, that's enough. I need to, I can run anytime I want on my own, but this is kind of now I need to focus in on school. So yeah. The beginning of my sophomore year, I came back with just a new focus on let me just focus on my studies and I can just run for enjoyment on my own. Yeah. Yeah. So. So so you went in with that interest in medicine. What was it that drew you to medicine and, and made you want to uh, pursue that field? 
I think it probably started in like junior high, high school, probably through different influences. I think my parents were an influence, even though they were both school teachers. My dad was in the army. Both my mom and dad uh, taught school for close to 35, 40 years. Um, so just seeing them kind of live like a, a service oriented lifestyle. Uh, we also grew up going to like Catholic church and had lots of different like role models throughout the school years. I think as, as I was young, you know, again, like uh, steering me towards a service oriented profession. And then I, I also had a doctor growing up that was uh, in mission fields, like mm. missionary medicine on the side mm -hmm. where he would. And I remember he had this book in his office of all these pictures where he was treating cleft palates, cleft lips of kids overseas just for free. And so I think just through that, definitely I remember sparked my interest that he could like make a difference in so many people's lives just through his, um, the skill that he had, uh, that he had learned. So, um, yeah, I think kind of early on, I was like driven towards, I want to be a doctor. I want to make a difference in people's lives. I want to, um, take care of people in that way. And, uh, and so I kind of had my mind set going into That's college, great. I think, which, which made it easier, maybe starting out in college, I kind of knew what I wanted to do. But, uh, it, yeah, it still was challenging, you know. So you mentioned your dad was in the military and was in the army. Uh, you also did, you did ROTC mm -hmm. while you were at, at Berkeley. Yeah. So did you, were you there on a scholarship or did it something you did just like a walk on, like you did with your, with your cross country or how did you yeah, decide to do that? Well, I kind of, I also just kind of walked into it. It's funny because my dad was already, had already retired from the army as a, he was an engineer, corps officer, lieutenant colonel. So he had already retired, I think in the early nineties. So I wasn't even in college yet, but he, uh, he was always telling my, myself and my sister and my two brothers, Hey, when you go to college, you should think about, you know, ROTC or going to an academy. I think you know, part of it was the financial incentive to just not have to pay for four kids going to college. But I think he also knew like, you know, it's a good leadership opportunity. It's a guaranteed job for four years and then you can get out and do whatever you want. But he always was like planting that seed. Mm -hmm. And I re I remember when I started college, he was like, Hey, you should think about ROTC. And I was like, Nope, that's not for me. I don't want anything to do with the army. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I couldn't, couldn't, couldn't even imagine that, yeah. uh, you know, and then, but then as, as the, uh, my freshman year unfolded the way it did, uh, you know, and then I came back my sophomore year, uh, you know, much more focused on school, gave up the running. I, I, I kind of like, again, opened the, the door was open for, hmm, maybe I could get a scholarship, you know, oh, maybe, oh, I could be an army doctor. So I think things started clicking a little bit, uh. And I opened my eyes to, well, and I think he was planting the seed again. Well, why don't you think about that? You can get a scholarship this way. So I walked in and I signed up for a class. And my sister, who was a year younger for me, was already, she was also going to UC Berkeley. So she was a freshman, I was a sophomore, and she was starting ROTC. And so there was another influence for me to be like, okay, well, let me go check it out too. Sure. Uh, you know, let me see what my dad's talking about here. And then that's when I basically, they kind of, you know, it, it was an easy uh, way to just step right in, get a scholarship, you know, uh, take some cool classes and meet a lot of great people. And so that I kind of went from there. Okay. So, to the program. so, yeah. So, I mean, normally we think of ROTC, you do your ROTC, you get your commission, you go on active duty, but that's not what you did. You actually uh, got accepted to medical school. Um, right. as, as planned. So how did that, how did the ROTC, um, play into med your medical school experience and, and, and get it, you know, how did you navigate that? Yeah. So I did, um, so I ended up doing two years, a two year scholarship for ROTC, my junior and senior year. And that kind of began to, you know, open the door for, okay, well, I'm going to, I'm going to be in the army. So let me pursue being an army doctor. And that's, that's where I learned that I could also get a scholarship to medical school through the Army called HPSP or the Health Profession Scholarship Program, which pays for all sorts of uh, military medical professional um, type schools. And so that was my goal then. So I was like, well, let me pursue 
this HPSP program for medical school and the ticket to getting your scholarship for HPSP is to get into medical school. And so it actually took me uh, four and a half years uh, to get through college, which was probably a great thing because it gave me an extra semester to kind of improve my GPA, take my time, uh, you know, get through the MCATs a couple times. Um, just that lengthy, uh, you know, journey to get into medical school itself uh, is almost the hardest part. But um, we also had to do a summer camp in order to graduate ROTC. You also have to go to this advanced camp kind of leadership culmination event uh, in order to get commissioned. And the first time I went, I actually failed it. Oh, oh, wow. I, I, yeah, I didn't pass because I, the, you get there and as soon as you get there, you have to take a PT test. And I, and, uh, you know, I could run like a 12 minute, two mile, but I failed the push ups. Oh no. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> so that was just like, you know, after doing the two year program and then I get to this thing, yeah. this, this event out at Fort Lewis, Washington right away, you know, didn't pass the push ups. So that was pretty actually devastating, which was also part of the reason why I took an extra semester, a little bit more yeah. time than expected to graduate from college. Cause I had to come back and spend the whole next year retraining, you know, lifting weights, doing some more upper body strength training, which I, I normally didn't do because I was just a really fast runner. Yes. Um, you know, so I had to, again, like I was a little off balance. So I had to go back, um, you know, set some new goals, retrain, get a stronger upper body. And then I went back the following summer and aced it, you know, did a whole bunch of push ups, passed it, <laughs> no problem. Yeah. And then that's, that's actually where I met my husband. Oh, is that right? That's at where, at advanced camp. Yeah, that's where Josh and I actually met. Oh, um, funny. Funny story. So it's funny how, you know, things don't work out, but then they kind of happen for a reason. Yeah. You know, so yeah. I, I always, my husband and I always tell that story of how we met that, you know, I failed my push ups. I had to go back the next year, but then that's where he and I ended up meeting. So I was like, good thing I, good thing I failed my push ups <laughs> that first year, you know? <laughs> so just, just. So. Josh is, uh, your husband, Josh is a medical service corps officer in the army as well. That's actually how you and I met is through yeah. Josh. Right. So, That's so great. you guys are, and I wanted to talk about that maybe a little later about being a dual military, or maybe it'll come up as we go yeah. being dual military okay, yeah. and the challenges of that as well. But That's Absolutely. neat. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, but yep. So then from there, uh, you know, that kind of set the timeline just naturally and, kind of basically everything worked out and I went into medical school on an army health profession scholarship. Okay. So you went to um, Kansas city university of, of medicine and biosciences in Kansas city. How did you wind up choosing to go to Kansas city university? Well, I knew the door was wide open to any school in the country in terms of the army scholarship. It, you know, the, if I could get into medical school, the tuition wouldn't be an, uh, an issue. And, you know, you can practically go anywhere in the country or any accredited medical school. So I tried to just cast a wide net and uh, ended up applying to a lot of not only MD schools, but DO schools, osteopathic schools. Mm -hmm. And I think my, I think my GPA was like a 3.4 coming out of college at UC Berkeley, which you know, I had to work my butt off to try to just get a B in a lot of these classes. Um, much different experience, I think, going to a huge school like that. So, you know, I wasn't the most competitive, probably, you know, I wasn't a 4.0 or a 3.8 type student going into medical school. So, so I, ha I knew I had to look outside the state of California because the California school systems are so competitive for medicine. Um, but I ended up getting into, you know, a couple different schools. And what I remember, I'll never forget when I went to interview at the school in Kansas City, it was the by far just the most friendly, uh, you know, the highest level of hospitality. It felt like they were selling their school to me, you know, mm -hmm. and all the wonderful reasons why I should come there. And I remember I wore my uniform on campus and every single person I came in uh, touch with during that day just had the best attitude and like you could tell they just loved going to that school and then even the interviewer I remember sitting in this gentleman's office for the interview and he was the most friendly guy he thought it was awesome you know that I was going to be serving my country and so I don't know just the warm and friendly inviting feeling I got from that school 
uh, just fit me immediately. And, and, and that's, I think that's a huge part why I ended up going there. I never thought I would be going to school in Kansas city, but it was just a wonderful city to be a part of for four years. And it was just a new adventure. You know, I'd never really lived outside the state of California. We didn't travel a whole lot growing up. So it was, uh, it was just a great new experience, new opportunity. So you became a pediatrician, but you don't do that in medical school. You have to, you know, you go through, as you know, you go through medical school and you, and you make a choice uh, uh, at some point, you know, about what residency you want to pursue. At what yeah. point did you decide, I want to do pediatrics? Um, I think probably by my third year of medical school, I knew once, once uh, we started all the rotations, the third and fourth year, first two years is uh, more academic Sec, uh, last two years is all the rotations where you're experiencing every aspect of the, the uh, medical field and doing all these different clinical rotations. And I remember just when I started the pediatric training portion and primarily like in all the different types of outpatient settings, I liked that the best right away. Cause I, I was already kind of thinking like, what do I want to do? That's going to that I could do for 30 years, you know, yeah. where do I, how do I see myself moving into something? And it was just with kids. I was like, and my, both my parents were school teachers with kids. So that probably was part of an influence too. They always enjoyed, you know, working with kids through their careers. But I was just like, yeah, I could, if I'm going to do medicine for 30 years to be a pediatrician is going to be rewarding. And most of the pediatricians I met were really happy people. <laughs> you know, there weren't a lot of grumpy, uh, angry pediatrician. So you, uh, you know, so it was, it was a right away. I kind of felt at home there, yeah. you know, and, uh, there's still a lot of things you can do within pediatrics, but, uh, yeah, that's where I felt like, okay, I can see myself doing this for a long time. Neat. So yeah. you graduated from medical school and you actually did your residency, uh, on active duty. So you, so you graduated yeah. and you finally, you went on active duty and you did your residency at Madigan Army Medical Center uh, in Tacoma, Washington. Um, yeah. So what was it like transitioning now to active duty and at the same time uh, transitioning to uh, residency? Gosh, that was, that was an exciting time. My, let's see. So started out at Madigan for three years there uh, doing the pediatric residency program. And we kind of hit the ground running. I, I remember because I had done ROTC, the Army part of it, the Army officer part of it, I was excited for. You know, whereas a lot of people, a lot of my peers were coming into the Army for the first time without ever having really worn the uniform before. Like maybe they went to OBC, but most people don't go to the academy or do ROTC uh, after, um, you know, coming into the Army uh, medical field that way. So. I mean, I remember one girl had her second lieutenant rank on, you know, the wrong way, you know, in the hospital and just seeing funny things like that, you know, yeah. with, with army doctors at the beginning. But uh, yeah, so no, I think the, the army officer piece was exciting for me. I felt ready to just embrace that. I knew I, I wanted to be a good army officer first. Mm -hmm. And then the doctor piece was just that first year. It's just an uphill climb because all of a sudden you're working 80 hours a week. You're a doctor. You don't really feel like you're a doctor, but you are, you know, you're seeing patients. You're, you know, you're just every month you're in a new part of the hospital, you know, ER, inpatient, outpatient, specialty clinic. And so it's just this uphill steep learning curve for the first year, you know, with where your confidence isn't really there yet, but you're, you got to start the job. So the, the practice begins. Yeah. And then by the second year, you're just, you figure things out. The second year gets to be more fun because now you kind of feel like you're getting a little better. You're getting a little more confident. You can feel comfortable making decisions. It's not as scary the second year. Yeah. But yeah, lots, lots of, uh, lots of lessons, lots of experiences, good and bad. So that leads me to, you know, you, you, my, one of the questions I like to ask when I talk with physicians is, um, uh, when did you know you were a physician? When did you feel comfortable looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually a doctor. Yeah. I Was think, it? I think in probably in the middle of residency where I actually felt like, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm a doctor. I'm doing this. I feel like I'm getting better at this. So I would say the first year for me, you're just trying to survive. Yeah. And then the second year you start coming into your element 
And, you know, the balance of the art and the science of medicine, you start to feel that out, you know, as you progress through residency, because you're, wa you're watching so many of your preceptors do, do things so differently. One person tells you to do it this way, and then the other person tells you to do it that way, and you start to figure it out yourself. There's an art here, too. Yeah. And uh, the, the human dimension dealing with people as your customers every day uh, that are so different. So, so yeah, I, I would say uh, second year, third year, you start to get into a groove and kind of start to develop your own style a little bit. Uh, it gets more fun. That's cool. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So you graduated from your residency in 2008. And you were assigned as the chief of pediatrics and chief of aviation medicine at Weed Army Community Hospital at Fort Irwin. And so um, Fort Irwin is one of those special places in, in army yeah. mythology, <laughs> but may, you know, folks who aren't familiar, what's uh, wh where's Fort Irwin and why do people know about it in the military? Well, it's Fort Irwin, California is in the middle of the Mojave desert in <laughs> Southern California. Yeah. Uh, you know, North of LA, San Diego, San Bernardino. And if anyone's ever driven through a uh, Barstow, which is basically like a truck, truck stop kind of on your way to Las Vegas or LA there. Um, yeah, it's like Barstow is the nearest town to Fort Irwin. And so literally once you hit Barstow, you know, there's a sign that says 31 miles this way to Fort Irwin and you follow that and it's just the two lane highway right into the army base with nothing in between. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting place. It's, it's probably the least desirable place to go, one of the, you know, because it's just not a pretty place and there's nothing out there, but a big, huge training area for units as they get ready to deploy. So the whole purpose of Fort Irwin is a big, huge kind of combat training center where every brigade combat team in the Army comes through and they train for a month before they go overseas on their deployment. But yeah, it's a it's an interesting place to be, and we were there for two years. That was our yeah. one of our first assignments. Yeah. So it's kind of a unique place. Um, how mm -hmm. uh, and so you were chief of chief of pediatrics. So mm -hmm. that so you were, went straight from residency to to being in charge of a of a of a service. So yes. that must have been a a bit of a exciting opportunity. Yeah, yeah, and it. For, I would describe the hospital there as probably similar to being in a small rural community hospital okay. because you're really at this tiny little hospital out in the middle of nowhere. And we had four pediatricians there. One was a nurse practitioner. And then there was three other pediatricians, myself, Dana, who was right out of residency as well. And then there was another gentleman who was 73 years old and he was the most experienced pediatrician. He was a retiree who just loved his job and and so we had a great team and, and yeah, I came in as the chief of pediatrics, the guy that was there before left and, and I somehow got the job and, but we had a great team. So it didn't feel as, and it was really a small kind of pediatric mission there, but yeah, we were, they were delivering babies there. And that was probably the most nerve wracking part was all these babies being born out in the middle of nowhere. And if something didn't go right, you really had to kind of everyone kind of came together to stabilize the baby before you shipped it to Loma Linda, yeah. which was a hundred miles. The nearest hospital was a hundred miles away. Wow. So you were really um, out there on your own. I mean, that's kind of, yes. uh, I guess that's kind of one of the exciting things about being at Fort Irwin is like, as a provider is, yeah. is, you know, you're, that's right. you're it. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So the, all the, all the doctors get to know each other in that hospital because again, that hospital is so small out there. And so everyone kind of, comes together because we're all kind of in the same boat, but it was a good place to be. So you had, you had some experience as a chief resident during your residency, but this was really your first like real independent leadership role. So what yes. was that like stepping into both your full independent practice, but also mm -hmm. uh, becoming a leader for the first time? It was good. It, it, uh, I think the most important thing I learned was that my training paid off. So all the, all the challenges I faced during my residency training, you know, the things that didn't work out, the scary times, uh, you know, you kind of see it all in residency. You see, you see from birth to death, really, in residency. And you see the, the cases that where mistakes were made, where you really have to AAR or have after action review type learning sessions where you're reviewing, like, how did we miss the diagnosis? How come the code didn't work out? 
And so I felt like the culmination of my training and then to end up at Fort Irwin as a little, as, as a leader at a remote base, the training paid off, everything kicked in and I was able to perform in the times where we needed to perform for the patient and and the team the team was phenomenal out there and i don't know if i had anything to do with that it was just like all the people out there just knew that we have to rely on the team to get the job done for patients mm-hmm. and so it was it was an incredible experience because it was also like kind of a confidence boost as well you know to know that i that i am i can do it you know i am mm-hmm. I am becoming, I am practicing medicine and we are getting things right for patients. And, um, but we also learned to like the de- decision-making, we learned to like not take a lot of risk. If, if a kid looked like they were going to be sick or were sick, we would transfer them uh, quickly, <laughs> Yeah, you know, get, get them out of there, get them to a, a place where they had all the capabilities. Yeah, We never took, we never took any chances also. So just understanding the environment. Um, and it, it was also the first time where uh, I had I had had two kids already at that time, and I think that made me a better doctor because I was always thinking like, if this was my kid, what would I want? Right. You know. So that way of thinking was also always part of the equation. How did um, so? I mean, that's kind of unique. You're a pediatrician. How did your yeah. perspective on pediatrics change after you had a after you had your own children? Oh yeah, tremendously. I, I think it made me a way better pediatrician to have your own kids and, and each kid is so different. And, and then you learn just like, gosh, being a parent is like the hardest thing in the world. And so, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I felt like uh, totally disqualified the first couple of years I was a pediatrician and I didn't have any kids trying to tell parents, I mean, trying to give parents advice. A lot of what people come in for is they want advice on you know, my kid's not sleeping through the night, you know, feeding is not going well. And here I am without any kids giving advice. It felt like I was just, you know, had no idea what I was talking about. But, you know, I'm following what the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines say. So I'm going to, I'm going to deliver that. But then you realize like you can kind of throw that out the window sometimes. And, you know, most of the times the parents are going to do the best they can and survive and figure it out. So I think it made me a better provider. Yeah. More humble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's one thing having kids will do is it'll, it'll make you more humble one way or another, I yeah, guess. Pediat- I pediatrician or not. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> All yeah. right. So, so you did a couple years at, at Fort Irwin. It sounds like it was a really good experience. And then you got, you got selected for a fellowship in adolescent mm-hmm. medicine. And so you shipped yeah. off to San Antonio, uh, to the San Antonio Military Medical Center. Um, So what does it mean to do a fellowship in adolescent medicine? So the fellowship, uh, it's an adolescent and young adult medicine fellowship, which was the Army does it. The Army trains people for three years. It's located in San Antonio, Texas. And it's a specialty off of pediatrics that really focuses on the 12 to 24-year-old population. So we just think of it kind of like junior high, high school, college kids. And so then you, you become a pediatrician who specializes in essentially teenagers and young adults. And there's a different set of like risk behaviors that impact health for junior high, high school and college kids. Obviously, we start talking about, you know, um, drugs and alcohol and sexual risk taking behaviors and, you know, much more of the behavioral realm. So it's, it's much more focused, I would say, on like sexual health sports medicine, behavioral mental health, all the things that happen to the body during puberty and things that happen along the way there. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of just kind of a, a specialty that I, I probably became interested in during my residency because for some reason, some of my favorite patients were like 16 or 17 years old. And I think I kind of felt like I could talk to the patient, not the mother you know, whereas like with a two-year-old, you're just talking to the parents. With the 16-year-old, you get to talk to the 16-year-old and they're making decisions and you're trying to influence the health of a young person. Um, and that was that was to build a relationship with the patient who's uh, high school or college age was to me was much more rewarding. Mm-hmm. And then also during my time at Fort Irwin, I got, I was also a flight surgeon down there. The army sent me to the flight surgeon school and as a flight surgeon, not only was I doing pediatrics down there, but I was also half time taking care of soldiers. 
And then I realized as an army doctor, my ultimate purpose is to take care of soldiers in uniform. Right. And so I was just like, you know what, I'm, I'm learning to be a really good pediatrician, but I need to be better at taking care of soldiers who are young adults, mostly half of, half of the uh, U S army is under the age of 25 years old. And so I said, well, this is probably a perfect fit. Then I, I already like the older kids. I want to be a better army doctor. I need to take care of soldiers. You know, they're mostly young adults. So let me do, it was just, to me, it was a no brainer. So I just applied for the fellowship and, uh, It's not a fellowship that a lot of people want to do. You know, I think most pediatricians, interestingly, most pediatricians don't want to uh, take care of teenagers. And so a lot of pediatricians uh, stop seeing patients around age 12. Uh, Okay. And if there, if there's an adolescent doctor around, they'll, the adolescent doctor will pick up the over 12 kids. So, um, but I actually really enjoyed it. So it was a great opportunity. And that's how we ended up in San Antonio. So, so you stayed, you, you did the training in San Antonio, you stayed on in San Antonio uh, as the assistant chief of the adolescent medicine service after your fellowship. And during that time, you deployed as a battalion surgeon. That's really interesting and a, and a, and a whole, new, yeah. uh, whole new challenge for you. Who did you deploy with and where did you go? Well, I deployed with the infantry battalion out of, uh, they were out of Fort Campbell, Kentucky, the 101st Airborne Division, and it was the second of the 506th Infantry Battalion. And it's kind of funny because we we ended up staying in San Antonio a year after I graduated fellowship. So so my husband, Josh, could finish the Baylor program. (laughs) Yes. And that's where I (laughs) met Josh. Right. That's where you knew Josh. Yeah, through that. But so we, I mean, we're always trying to align our what we're doing to stay on the same page. So I ended up staying in San Antonio an extra year and they made me the assistant chief of the adolescent clinic. So I could kind of start helping out with that. And then it was funny because this tasker popped up uh, over email and I had never deployed before. And it was, you know, lots of people had already deployed. And I was like, geez, if, if there's a deployment, I'm going to probably get it. And so we were kind of already prepared for that. And this tasker pops up over email one day and it's just, they're like looking for this, per, they're looking for a doctor to fill uh, this sh- like four to five month deployment. It's the back half of a deployment. They're already in Afghanistan. The The current battalion surgeon that's over there had to leave for some reason. And so I I basically emailed back and just said, yes, I'll say, I volunteered for it without even talking to Josh or asking permission or anything. I just kind (laughs) of, and I, I came home that day from work and I'm like, so I just volunteered to go to Afghanistan. And I don't know how, I don't know if that went over well, you know, too much, but but Uh anyway, so I ended up, I ended up just going uh, within, I think it was, I had to leave within like three weeks. Wow. And yeah, so it was, it was a quick turn and I had just come out of this fellowship. I was ready to do something a little bit different. Josh had to finish his training Um, I knew I was probably going to get deployed at some point anyways. And this little kind of four to five month tasker came up quickly. And I just said, let me take that one because it it was going to be short. I had a, I could kind of have a choice on the timeline there. Yeah. And so I went over, it was, and I showed up at Bob Salerno in the middle of Afghanistan with this infantry battalion with 700 uh, people. And they were basically getting ready to shut down the FOB and convoy back to Bagram Air Force Base because their mission at FOB Salerno was coming to an end. Yeah. And so I was at FOB Salerno for three weeks. They were only eating MREs. The defect was closed and it was like bare bones out there. Yeah. And so we had a, we were running a, a aid station, essentially a roll one aid station. And that's all they had out there. And so it was me and a physician assistant and uh, just the medics. And uh, luckily, nothing uh, crazy happened during that time. Uh, the three weeks we were out there, it was, it was just mostly um, acute care type stuff happening. Nobody got majorly injured. Um, and then soon enough, within a month that I was there, we had this long, I remember the entire battalion convoyed for 10 hours through Afghanistan to get back to the major Air Force base. And so I, I just remember sitting in the back of a vehicle through the entire night, realizing that we were rolling through Afghanistan. Right. It was a, it was, that was an interesting experience too. Yeah. So FOB, forward operating base, what is that for, for civilian yeah. listeners? What does that, what does that look like? What, what you so you had 700 men, you're mm-hmm. out 
mm-hmm. what was uh, what were living quarters like? What was the you know physical? Yeah, it's um, it's it's just think of it like a little fenced in. Gosh, you, you could probably I I remember running around it. Everyone would run around the fence line in the morning to exercise, and uh, might have been maybe a mile around. So it was a, a, a mile loop kind of around the, the fenced in forward operating base. And um, the the infantry battalion's mission was to kind of pull security in the area around, around the fob outside. So, um, but yeah, on the fob, we just, I mean, yeah, the living conditions, essentially we all had little just tiny trailers just with almost like a small little dorm room the bathrooms were outside, you had to walk, you know, outside to use the bathrooms. Uh, and then, you know, walked kind of across the way just to either eat, uh, get to work, which was again, just a tiny little building where people worked out of. And uh, I mean, so there was primitive. not much going on. Very yeah, primitive, very, very primitive. primitive. So very, then you spent, uh, yeah. Yeah. So then okay. you spent the rest of your deployment at Bagram. Uh huh. What was that like? Now that was, um, that was actually more enjoyable. I would say just, there was much, it was a big air force base, a lot more happening there. You know, they had like green beans, coffee, pizza hut, uh, you know, a a big MW, a big kind of morale center with, you could go in and play video games or use the computers, make phone calls. Um, There was, it was much more like a built up little town and we operated out of a bigger clinic there. So the, the providers uh, worked in a, a much bigger clinic that actually had a little pharmacy and took x-rays and multiple exam rooms. And there was three or four providers. And I was one of them that worked at the clinic uh, and we stayed busy all day there, but we could go to the gym. You know, they had a bigger cafeteria. Um, the, again, the, the living area was still about the same. You just had your small little trailer that you lived in with like a bed and a desk. But yeah, was, there was a little bit more of a routine there. Okay. So you did four or five months there. What impact did that have on you as an officer and as a military physician? I think it had a huge impact because uh, it was the first time where I was living the deploy fight and win mission. So it really showed me, you know, the purpose of the U S army is to deploy fight and win the nation's wars as part of the joint force. And and I, there I was, you know, as as an army doctor deployed forward with the infantry, who is typically the ones, you know, who are forward in combat. And uh, and I was taking care of those guys. You know, I was kind of you kind of feel like you're the team doctor and just and I always describe it to people, too. Like just like a, if you were part of a football team and you were the doctor, you're kind of the team doc helping those guys stay fit to fight, stay healthy, to uh to do the mission that they're designed to do. And, and as an army doctor, it was the first time where I felt like, you know, the mission of the U S army is not medicine. You know, medicine is an able, is an enabling function. We call it a sustainment or fighting function where we're out there to sustain the force so they can defend the nation. And it was the first time I was like actually a part of the real U S army mission. And uh, you know, I think a lot of times as army doctors, when we're just in the hospital all the time, we're so detached from the real mission of the U S army. Mm-hmm. And so for me, it was just like the light bulb went on, you know, being part of the mission. So that was cool. So you came back and in 2014, you moved to Fort Riley, Kansas uh, to be the brigade surgeon. Uh, what does it mean to be a brigade surgeon? So a brigade surgeon is a, is basically, again, you're the team physician for a brigade combat team, which is about four to 5,000 soldiers. Wow. And the brigade combat team is, is the army's again, main source of kind of combat power. Uh, The army kind of fights and wins the nation's wars with brigade size elements for the most part, brigade combat teams. And most of them are infantry or armor. Uh, They're, you know, again, it's, it's the infantry. It's uh. Um, you know, they're the tip of the spear. They're, they're the deploy, fight, and win element of our uh, nation's freedom. And so to be, again, I, I think my deployment experience right away showed me 
I have all the skills as an army doctor now with the young adult medicine fellowship training, uh, the ROTC background. I understand the mission. I, I feel like I'm a good army officer and a good doctor. And so I volu- I actually volunteered to be a brigade surgeon. I uh, called our you know personnel division and said, I want to be a brigade surgeon. And so okay. again, it was like, okay, well, like, here you go. You know, let's <laughs> make sure we can get you somewhere where Josh can my husband can have a job and you can be a brigade surgeon. And, uh, and yeah, so it was, it's probably the best job I've ever had being a brigade surgeon. Um, but, but the term again, the brigade is just the, the unit. And then the surgeon piece is that's just what the army calls their physicians. And it's okay. most people, most people go into it as a primary care physician. So, so you, um, now as a brigade surgeon, this much larger scale, than as a battalion yeah. surgeon, right? So, yeah. whereas with the battalion, you were kind of the team doc for the battalion. As a brigade, uh-huh. you're the team doc, but that's a different, there's a different scale there. There's right? a different scale, yeah. And different responsibilities. Um, mm-hmm. So talk talk a little bit about that. So you, okay. you, you had battalions beneath you now. Yes. So the brigade, so the battalion is about 700 people and the brigade is about 4,500 people. So in the brigade, there are seven battalions. Each battalion is typically led, the medical care for each battalion is typically led by a PA. And so if you think about it, the brigade, the brigade has the physician to supervise the PAs. So now as the brigade surgeon, you're not only responsible for the medical care and medical readiness of 4,500 soldiers, but part of your job is, is supervising the seven physician's assistants that you have under you. So you have seven PAs and they're providing care as dependent providers with the supervision of the brigade surgeon. So again, it's a leadership role and uh, we all worked out of a uh, primary care clinic. We all worked out of the same clinic in a medical home environment, but you know, primary care is typically delivered out of a, a patient centered medical home. And we called ours a soldier centered medical home. And so we kept that machine running. You know, we ran a great clinic. And we're uh, kind of leading medical readiness for the entire brigade combat team, which is commanded by a, a 06 colonel, uh, typically an infantry or armor officer. Okay. And so we're working for that guy, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So while you were there, uh, you deployed again. Uh, where did you go and yeah. what did you do? So uh, when I, as soon as we got to Fort Riley and I was coming in as the brigade surgeon, uh, within a month, we deployed to Camp Buren, Kuwait, and the entire brigade deployed forward. Uh, again, 4,500 people, and we were stationed out of Camp Buren, Kuwait, which uh, the unit, the brigade was responsible to be like the support, uh, to be in a support role if anything happened forward in, in Iraq or Jordan. So we were really spread out. They had, they had a small element pushed forward uh, up in Taji, Iraq. And then they had another a small element pushed up to Baghdad, Iraq. And then they had another small element, I think, stationed out in Jordan. But the main brigade, the majority of the people were training at Camp Buring, basically at the ready in case anything was going to blow up north. Um, so it was mainly, you know, the team continued their training mission out of Camp Buring. And again, we're, we're on point forward up in Iraq, uh, just postured. Uh, in case anything was going to blow up there. Now, as as a brigade surgeon and uh, uh, in this role, um, mm-hmm. you're doing more than just patient care. You're doing more than just um, uh, supervising yeah. the PAs, right? You are also right. a medical planner responsible for the overall uh, medical mm-hmm. plan. Right. So can you talk a little bit about that and what that portion of your role was like? Yeah, yeah. So um, I would say that there's two main elements. If you just kind of break it down to the bare bones of what what we do, uh, say a, a brigade surgeon or a battalion surgeon does, um, you're working you're working with a team of, like you said, medical planners, medical operations folks, and uh, non commissioned officers and senior medics. But there's two things we're responsible for: combat casualty care, which is what the combat medic is going to do at the point of injury. So we're planning for that and uh, the medical readiness of the entire unit. And that's really like the healthcare delivery portion. So I always kind of break it down into those two aspects of our mission. 
but the unit is constantly training. So if they're not deployed, they're training. And so what we do is we're also responsible for the medical planning of every training mission that's happening. And so there's all medical is always at the table and we're always a part of every operation. And there's a lot of planning uh, that goes into that. Typically the brigade surgeon is, is part of that equation, but the brigade surgeon also has a medical operations officer on the team. That's going to kind of lead the charge on that. Uh, um, and so you learn a lot from your medical operations folks and just how, how medicine is truly integrated into every operation and how important it is for uh, the war fighters if something happens to them. So in 2016, you moved again, and this is kind of a theme with military life. Um, you bound, uh, you, you, so, uh, you moved mm -hmm. to be the service chief for adolescent and young adult medicine at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, which is up in the mm -hmm. Washington DC area for folks who aren't familiar with it. Um, I'm gonna kind of fast forward here. And okay. then in 2018, staying in the same area, you, you moved to staff job, as, uh, a staff job as a defense health agency liaison to the mm -hmm. Joint Staff Surgeon Office. So let's talk oh, a little yeah. bit about, this is a, a, a yeah. really different uh, kind of assignment from what you've done before. You're out of clinical medicine now. Right, um, right. You're not in a deployable unit. You're with the Defense Health Agency. So what is the Defense Health yeah. Agency and what were you doing? So the Defense Health Agency is uh, kind of began back in 2013 and uh, is a combat support agency. So I think it's one of 19 CSAs or combat support agencies across the Department of Defense. And the DHA's job is to enable the Army, Navy, and Air Force. Uh, it's, it's kind of an enabler of the services to provide a medically ready force in peacetime and in war. And, and I think it was uh, essentially started to control the cost of healthcare across the DOD and eliminate a lot of redundancies of running hospitals across the Army, Navy, and Air Force. Each of them were delivering healthcare and running hospitals and essentially doing the same thing, but doing it differently, which, which just creates a very expensive and redundant system. And so I think it's the, essentially, you know, the DOD's way to start downsizing and integrating healthcare across the Department of Defense. And so the DHA is kind of a way to do that. It also allows the, the Army, Navy, and Air Force to focus on the deploy, flight, and win mission, the operational aspect of what the, the services are designed to do. Mm -hmm. and let the de defense health agency run hospitals across the entire DOD. Um, again, to make that process more efficient, higher quality of care, lower cost. And now like, you know, Army, Navy, and Air Force, they can focus on their resources forward to make operational medicine more focused and better. So it's, it's interesting. So I essentially got to be a part of that. I was at Walter Reed. Uh, we, we moved out there. Again, the Army moved us out to the D.C. area for Josh's job and, and for me to have a job out there, too, at Walter Reed and worked in the adolescent medicine clinic again. And then this opportunity essentially came up. Uh, they put out a notice on email asking for um, volunteers. They had this new liaison position to the, uh, for the DHA to the Joint Staff Surgeon, and they were asking volunteer for volunteers. And I was, all, I, I think just coming out of the brigade surgeon role, being so focused on medically readiness, readiness focus on the warfighter, focus on the operational mission, I, I was seeking that again. Work, working at Walter Reed as a clinician, I felt like I could do that in my sleep. And it was, it was just honestly a little bit boring, you know, because I felt like I could do that at any point in my life without the uniform on. Okay. You know, it didn't feel like I was... It, it was not a rewarding couple years for me there because even though I was taking care of adolescents and doing what I love, I was missing the army part of it. And I think coming out of such a great job as a brigade surgeon, where actually, actually um, our when I was a brigade surgeon at Fort Riley, General Odierno, who was the chief of staff at the army at the time, recognized uh, my brigade commander for having the highest medical readiness across the army. Ah. And I, and I remember realizing like my team did that for my commander. Yeah. You know, we, we delivered, you know, we hit a home run in terms of the medical care and the readiness we delivered to that brigade over two years because it, 
my commander got recognized for that. And, uh, and so then kind of boom, going to Walter Reed, going right back into the clinic. I was, to me, I was just like, this is, if I'm going to be in the army and wear this uniform, I need to get back to taking care of the soldier who's also a young adult. And, uh, so this DHA position came up and I, I raised my hand for it. And I think I was only one of a few people who interviewed for it. So I had to go interview. And during the interview, they asked a whole bunch of questions about operational medicine. And I felt like I had a really strong background in operational medicine from being a flight surgeon, a battalion surgeon, a brigade surgeon, the deployments, really understanding what that's all about. And, and I think my enthusiasm for all that came out and like the next day they called me and they're like, you got the job. And so they're like, when can you start? And I'm like tomorrow. (laughs) And so literally like within a week I was at the DHA trying to figure out like, okay, um, uh, never really thought about the DHA before or heard about it. And it's, you know, again, started in 2013 as a combat support agency. So it's a huge culture change for the military healthcare system across the services, but probably for the better. And so it was really cool to be a part of that for 18 months. Really cool. Since June of 2019, you have been serving as the division surgeon for the 101st Airborne. So Mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about the 101st Airborne. Well, the 101st Airborne is a famous unit. It's probably the most, one of the strongest divisions in the U.S. Army. Definitely the most famous from uh, World War II. And uh, the Secretary of Defense in the past called it the tip of the spear. And now that I'm actually there, geez, I believe it. It is, uh, they're called the Screaming Eagles. Um, and their, their entire mission is air assault. And basically what, their, what air assault is, is a brigade-sized element. Again, about 4,000, 5,000 people. Essentially, uh, their mission is to air assault behind enemy lines to seize an objective. And I would say if you could just imagine the movie like Black Hawk Down, where guys are coming in, Black Hawks and helicopters are flying in and people are uh, fast roping down on the helicopter. That's called that's an air assault. Uh So an air assault, air assault can move people and air assault can move equipment. And so essentially you could you could take people and equipment and insert them quickly behind enemy lines to seize key terrain or seize an objective and defeat the enemy. And that's what this, the 101st Airborne Division, that's their entire mission. So we've talked about battalions. We've talked about brigades. What's a division? A division is about 20,000 people. Wow. So it's about 20,000 soldiers. And they have, let's see, six, uh, let's see, six brigades. So there's, there's, a, there's three brigade combat teams. There's a sustainment brigade, an aviation brigade. And then there's like a Devardi uh, kind of field artillery brigade. And so again, a, 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 a brigade has seven battalions, a division has about six brigades. And so now as the division surgeon, uh, it's, it's again, the senior physician, or you're kind of the team doctor for a division now. Just So it's just uh, the next level up. And I'm supervising six physicians who are, you know, in charge of their physician assistants. So the pyramid just kind of got one level higher, essentially. So wow, neat. Yeah, yeah. Talk, talk about the medical infrastructure and capabilities with that are organic to a division um, that okay. you are kind of overseeing and 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 planning for. Yeah. So really, our infrastructure is based on what the brigades have. So each brigade runs essentially. The army calls it roles of care. A battalion runs a role one aid station, which is more acute care, triage, stabilization. And then a brigade is responsible for running a role two level type care on the back. Again, this is all on the battlefield and role, role two is think of it more like a primary care clinic. They have radiology, uh, they have pharmacy, they have blood. Um, they have all the primary care stuff. They can do emergency care, um, acute care, routine care. So uh, they also have behavioral health, uh, dentistry, Um, So the brigade is going to be uh, running role two capability across the world on whatever mission um, they're going to. That's what we did when we were uh, at Camp Buren, Kuwait. Um, And so when we're planning for missions, we plan through, we plan role one and role two capability. And uh, 
again, the division at the, at the division surgeon level, we're just overseeing and integrating in all the different uh, roles of care uh, across the, the different brigades. And right now at the 101st, our, the brigades are really all over the world. It would only be like in a large scale combat operation that we would probably deploy as an entire division somewhere. Okay. So right now, uh, people are still spread out. So that's got a that's got to create some unique challenges um, yeah. in terms of planning and making sure that medical support is 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 available to those units when they are scattered across the globe. It's challenging because so we're essentially tracking all all those uh, units as patients. You know, patients are essentially moving across the globe too. Because if you think about it, the army is providing care healthcare from the point of injury, wherever that might be, all the way through the healthcare system back to the United States. So uh, the army calls it roles of care, role one, two, three, four, and five. Mm -hmm. And um, so we start out by providing healthcare at the point of injury, wherever that might be. Role one care is, is what the battalion would provide. That's mostly triage and acute care and emergency care and stabilization. Uh, role two care is is bigger than that. You can still provide acute care and emergency care, but you have um, blood and x-ray and pharmacy and dentistry and behavioral health and primary care. And uh, you can even attach a, a forward surgical team to a role two to have some surgical capability. But then if the patient needs to move beyond that, then we move them back to role three, which is a big bigger hospital and theater. And then role four and five is um, hospitals back in the in, uh, CONUS or in the continental United States. So it really as a division, as our units are all over the world, we're tracking kind of the healthcare system um, from, from way out there all the way back uh, to the United States. So it's, it's uh, I guess, integration and, um, and oversight is, is part of the job too. So it's pretty interesting. So you've talked about role one, role two, you mentioned, um, and you mentioned Ford surgical teams. So there are actually a number of, and, and then you, and then you mentioned role, you mentioned role three and four. Mm-hmm. I, I'm curious, what are your, what is your role as the division surgeon for uh, interacting with these other, um, mm-hmm. m- these, these uh, higher level medical units yeah. that aren't, aren't organic to um, the division, but yet attached to the right. division or get assigned to provide support to division assets. Right. So for me, and as a division surgeon, there's a couple key folks that I'm interacting with at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, where the 101st uh, resides out of. It's the hospital commander. So we have Blanchfield Army Community Hospital that is in place to dis- to support medical care for the division and all the family members that live on Fort Campbell. So I interact with, with that person a lot, uh, more of just uh, making sure that we have a good relationship. And as they work to support the division and I work for the division commander, you know, and, and, and our missions are happening all over the world. I, my job is to make sure that the hospital commander understands the priorities and the mission sets. So he's um, able to provide appropriate support. And then the other person that I probably interact with is the field hospital commander, who is um, another colonel who's in charge of the, what would be the role three uh, theater or or combat support hospital. So, uh, and there's, so you almost got like your, your, your community hospital that's just permanently assigned on the base And then you have your uh, operational combat support hospital that's going to move when the, if the division went forward or a division went forward, then the role three or the combat support hospital would move forward as well. Mm -hmm. So it's just, so that role three, there's also a role three stationed at Fort Campbell. And so we interact with that uh, unit a lot for training purposes, I would say, and just to maintain the relationship there. So aside from, obvious things like battle injuries that people tend to think of military medicine, like you're somebody's, uh, you know, the, uh, one of your brigade goes out, goes out on a mission, somebody gets hurt, mm-hmm. you know, and, and gets that, you know, the treatment, uh, at the role one role mm-hmm. two and so forth, and then maybe evacuated further back. 
Uh, what are the other major medical threats that you have to prepare for as a medical planner with deployed, me- in, in, you know, in a deployed environment? Mm-hmm. I would say a lot of infectious diseases, um, a lot of uh, environmental threats, just even from the drinking water. So uh, one of the officers on our team is an environmental science officer. And one of her roles is uh, vaccine health. That's she, she does everything vaccine related. And obviously we, the army has probably every, every vaccine that you could possibly have to protect people from infectious disease threats all over the world. And the U S army is also huge on helping develop new vaccines such as, you know, to pr- protect from, from threats like Zika or Ebola, you know, all these other diseases that are a threat to the health of the force. So yeah, I would say I would say vaccine health is a big part of what we do, and then just the environment. So ant, from anywhere from animals to drinking water, everywhere we go, uh, making you know we're we always assume that we'll be moving into an austere uh, environment in some you know kind of part of the world, and so we always have environmental experts that are out there. Um, making sure that the environment is set up for safety to keep people healthy. Uh, for example, when we went out to a training site just at Fort Campbell in the fall for two weeks for training, uh, they moved us to live in these little, really kind of run down buildings that looked like they should be demolished, you know, but like that's where everyone was sleeping and the doors and windows were open. And what they found in those buildings were bats. There was bats living oh. in there. Yeah. So we had to call we had to call out the environmental science people to come out and um, apparently the the bats were like a protected species but they had to displace them and move them to a you know but bats can cause rabies so then we're right. we have all these people out there uh, sleeping and there's bats running around and flying around um, so it's just that was to me was just a good example of like everywhere we go in an austere environment we have to keep the environmental health piece a huge part of what we do to keep people healthy. So I think, I think one of the, uh, you know, obviously having myself also been a medical service court officer. I mean, I think one of the things that was interesting to me as I yeah. learned the history of med, you know, military medicine was kind of what you're talking about, which is the environmental threat and the control of disease, because what is it probably up through Vietnam? We had more mm-hmm. casualties from, yeah, disease and, and non-battle injury, meaning environmental you know, dis- uh, uh, injuries and so forth. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And even like even other threats, um, I would say another huge threat is just the weather. And probably probably one of the leading cause of training uh, deaths is heat injuries. So we just have, you know, even at Fort Campbell every year, a dozen people, uh, you know, have heat major heat injuries just from doing road marches that are 12, 26 miles long in July and August. Uh, um, yeah, but, but you're absolutely right. Just history time and time again has shown us that more people will be sick, injured, or die um, in an austere environment um, in combat, not from combat injuries, but from all the diseases, you know, the non-combat injuries that we're exposed to while we're out there. And we know that that'll be the same in the future as well. Um, for sure. You you also have a garrison mission, right? Meaning you have a field mission when you're out either deployed or when you're out on operations, but you also oversee a garrison mission, meaning when you're, when you're back um, uh, uh, in garrison, as we refer to back, not deployed. Um, so talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So I would say in a medical team, you know, truly we're an integrated system of health and readiness across the entire not only the entire world, but locally here at our installation um, where soldiers are back home with their families and working and training and always preparing for the next major event. But uh, 90% of all the medical care that we deliver is primary care. Okay. And so it's really important to have uh, primary care physicians in the Army because the majority of where we take care of soldiers and promote their health and prevent injuries and get them ready uh, for their mission is in the primary care medical home environment. And so across the division here, we're planning for and executing and seeing about 100,000 appointments a year in our primary care medical homes. We have three different clinics across Fort Campbell that soldiers get their medical care. And I think it's important to understand that 
in our in our readiness mission as as we're getting troops ready to deploy and um, train in support of our nation's defense health is the foundation of readiness you know and that's that's this is where it's really important for everyone on the team to understand that it's the it's the soldiers and the people that are getting the job done they're the ones that are flying the helicopters and driving the trucks and moving the equipment and all the cool things the army does um it's it's people that are doing it and so health is the foundation of all of that and um the majority of what we see is musculoskeletal injuries. So sports medicine is happening okay. every day. That's probably that's probably about 70% of what we do is sports medicine. And that just makes sense with how physical, how, how important physically uh, to be physically fit is for soldiers in, in the army. Yeah, um, so you, a lot of musculoskeletal. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned, uh, you used the phrase um, that you were, or, or you used the metaphor that you're like the team doctor for the, the 101st. And I really kind of, yeah. I think that's a really apt uh, uh, metaphor mm-hmm. because this, uh, a lot of, a lot of what they're, they're doing is they're, they're kind of professional athletes in a way, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, they are, soldiers are professional. I mean, they are like, they're warrior athletes, they're professional athletes and a lot of uh, similarities just to, as if we were serving on a sports team, except our mission is to defend our nation's freedom. Um, but these are, you know, 18 to mostly 25, 26 year old men and women that have very physically, you know, mentally demanding jobs. And we're here to take care of the team so the team can take care of the mission. And as you know, uh, medicine is a team sport. So there's, you know, everybody on the team in the medical community matters, and we're all truly working together. That primary care provider kind of leading the way for the unit, for the team, and uh, we're just working together to take care of these soldiers so that they can be on point for the nation and 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 stay healthy. Right, right. I mean, you you were talking about. Uh, we talked earlier about people. These young people are carrying, you know, going long road marches, carrying heavy packs. I mean, that's just a, that's a piece of the training that, that ordinary civilians just don't do in a day to day and even athletes, you know, don't do right. This is a a uniquely physically stressful field. Absolutely. And if you look at what the, what the mission of the 101st is, is the air assault and um, the infantry and soldiers have to be able to road march many, many miles. And they do that in the training environment every day. And if you think about in the civilian world, uh, you know, I like to run and lots of people exercise every day for, for health and social activity. But um, most people, you know, would jump into a 5K or a 10K or a half marathon. Never would you put 50, 30, 70 pounds on your back and a pair of boots on and, and a full uniform and then have to go do that in all sorts of um, extreme austere environments. And so if you just look at what our soldiers are asked to do, and they do it in a very courageous and mighty way. It makes sense that you know the musculoskeletal, the stress on the body is going to be high, and so we see a lot of that every day in the clinic. And I, I constantly tell our medical team too, you know, it's a team sport. The health of every single soldier matters, and and we've got the best job in the world taking care of these guys that are that are truly almost kind of like extreme athletes in a lot of ways. So. So you've been practicing medicine in one shape or another for 15 years now. Um, mm-hmm. What's been the most gratifying uh, uh, aspect of, of the practice of medicine for you? Um, definitely, uh, definitely the taking care of people and uh, just trying to make a difference in people's lives, I think is, is what uh, keeps driving me forward. Uh, even just the other day, I took care of a soldier who, uh, was training for the best ranger competition and um, started to have lower leg pain. And so they called me about this guy because he's there's like you know nine people right now in the running for best ranger at Fort Campbell. And they won the entire competition for the Army last year. So it's a big thing. But I brought this guy right in, you know, treated him like a professional athlete. We got him in the MRI machine within three days because we were concerned about a stress fracture in his tibia you know, sure enough, he had a stress fracture in his tibia. And I wanted him to feel confident, number one, and what his diagnosis was that was preventing him from train, training and causing him pain. But then to, to give him 
a thumbs up, like we're going to get you back into the, into your, back to your team, back to training, back to the fight within eight weeks. You know, that was our goal. So um, I, it's just making a difference for people. I think that does it for me and delivering amazing customer service. Uh, I think that's the other uh, thing that I really take a lot of pride in is I see medicine as part of what we need to do is be exceptional at customer service because we're dealing with people's livelihoods and their health and their well-being. And it's kind of like a life or death business in a lot of respects. Yeah, that, that, to me, that's the rewarding part. And uh, taking care of soldiers is special too because, you know, it's, these guys are uh, defending our nation's freedom. And especially what I've learned from the infantry is is if someone's going to if someone's going to shed blood or sacrifice themselves for our country in defense of our nation, it's going to be these guys, you know, the infantry. And most of these guys are like 20 years old, you know, and they're doing some pretty like abnormal extreme things that most people would never do. Like road marching 12 miles with 70 pounds on their back. You know, it's like, who does that? Nobody. Oh, the infantry has to though. That's their mission, you know? So, and then they have overuse injuries and uh, stress fractures and, it's like, of course they will have that, you know? And so, but for me, I just, I take a lot of pride in trying to keep these guys healthy and fit and then get back to the fight and make sure that they can still do their jobs, I guess. So it's, yeah, it's rewarding. So we've talked a lot. uh, Josh has come up a number of times, your husband, who is also an army officer. He's a medical service Mm -hmm. corps officer. Um, Right. And, uh, and, and so I just, what I was, what I wanted to hear from you, and uh, maybe in, in, because we hear a lot about couples trying to have uh, meaningful careers in the civilian world, and and you know both both members of a couple trying to make that work. Mm-hmm. The military, uh, you know, uh, as we've been talking, you you moved all these times, and and you mentioned some of these moves you've tried to, you know, you've you've had to try to make arrangements so that both of you could, you know, c- could continue to move your careers forward. What's uniquely challenging about having, uh, uh, being dual military and trying to maintain those, you know, professional uh, careers moving forward? Yeah, well, it's uh, yeah, we've been doing this together for about fifteen years, and uh, as a dual military couple, so we're both serving and, um, you know, trying to advance in our careers and get more training and education and uh, we're both driven to make a difference and um, to, to be good leaders for other people, you know, first and foremost. Uh, and so it's been, there's definitely been sacrifices and challenges. Uh, we, we tell people that between the two of us, we've had five deployments, you know, Josh has had three deployments and I've had two deployments and I'll probably have another one. Uh, that's probably the hardest part I think is, the time apart uh, on those big, huge uh, trips. But we both understand that the Army's purpose is to deploy, fight, and win the nation's wars. And and part of our job in uniform is to maintain our deployable status. And so I think uh, we just, we understand that and uh, understand that that's ultimately what it takes and why this is a sacrificial profession. So I think because we both understand the purpose greater than self aspect of serving in the U S army We're 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 both on board to try to give it 20 years, you know, and, and to be all in there does come sacrifice, but I believe that we try to balance that really well um, with being very deliberate and intentional about our, our time as a family uh, around those big events. So, for example, like any kind of temporary training or schools we have to take, we've done a lot of our training, like distance learning. For example, the army makes officers go to this intermediate level kind of leadership education called ILE or command and general staff college. And both Josh and I did that online distance learning intentionally. So we wouldn't have to go away for another training. You know, Mm -hmm. a lot of people go four months TDY or nine months here or there. And we were just like, nope, we'll just do it online because we don't want to take any time away from our family or, and then we have three kids. And so they're, uh, they're ages, um, eight, 10 and 12. And so we kind of just tell them, you know, this is, this is our mission field right now, you know, to be in the army is like being on mission. It's a, it's a special, uh, 
career path that we've chosen and just kind of built our life around. Uh, so it's a lifestyle choice. But uh, I feel like our family is our family unit is very tight and very strong, and it's brought us. I think it's made us a stronger um, uh, family in a lot of different ways too. Versus versus torn us apart. It's brought us together. We're like, well, if we could survive going to Af- if if we could survive mom going to Afghanistan for five months, then like what else could be harder than that? You know, right. we did it. And uh, but we we have a lot of family support too from grandmas and grandpas and brothers and sisters and friends and. So I think we have a, a, a good community network and family network just around our immediate family that's that's helped us a lot. We probably couldn't have done it without them as well. So, but yeah, it's it's definitely challenging and uh, and we just try to take it kind of one day at a time, one month at a time, you know. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about leadership. Okay. What would you say is your leadership philosophy? You know what I've I've been studying a lot and. I think this is something that's been in been in my mind and my heart and my and kind of just how I operate for a long time is just servant leadership. And so I think it goes back to just understanding that I that I'm in like a dual service profession as an army officer and as a physician. Um, you know, I'm in, I'm in a profession of service. As a physician, I see myself as a servant. Uh, for other people to enable their health. And so, yeah, so I would say servant leadership to me is the only kind of leadership that I'm interested in. And I don't know if I always get it right, but uh, I I see myself as a servant leader. So my job is to serve the mission, serve the organization, serve the people and enable their success through coaching, mentoring. The army has a slogan called mission first people always. Mm -hmm. And I learned that when I was in ROTC and I think I've just lived by that, you know, where we're here for the mission, but it's always about the people. And, um, every team I've been on, I just, I really try to put people first and take care of my team and enable my team success. So empower them, really, uh, help them clearly see like the mission, the vision, the goals of the team and the organization and steer people in that direction. Um, but, but I, I, I do everything I possibly can to empower the people on my team to reach their highest potential. Is there somebody you learned that from in particular or saw, I mean, you mentioned, uh, so you mentioned you heard, you know, you hear everybody who goes to ROTC learns the, you know, mission first people always kind of phrase, but I mean, did you see somebody that really embodied that or did you learn that from somebody? Did you have a chance to see a leader who really embodied it and executed Uh, it? I would say I've seen a couple leaders execute it and I, I probably didn't realize like that they were, but I was just like, there's been a couple people I've worked for that have just really stood out in their leadership. Like, like I totally look up to them and I look at their leadership and, and I'm just like, I want to be like them. You know, how do I, how do I be like a leader like them? Mm-hmm. And I would say uh, one of the folks was when I was in residency uh, we had a doctor named Dr. Pentel, and he was our program director in residency. And he was just like this amazing leader. And And I look back now and I'm like, he was definitely a servant leader. Uh, I had another leader in ROTC, Jim Craig, who's now, I think he's a professor at the University of uh, Missouri, St. Louis. Um, he's retired from the army, but I look back now at his leadership as one of the best leaders I worked for. And he was a, he was definitely a servant leader. And then I, uh, one of my brigade commanders out of Fort Riley, Colonel Tim Hayden, he was like an amazing leader who totally empowered, you know, the medical team to hit home runs, uh, backed us up. He was humble. He was, you know, results uh, focused at the same time, but just totally humble and totally kind and like the nicest guy you've ever met at the same time, but expected high results at the same time. And, Mm -hmm. and I look back at my time working for him and I'm like, it was obvious he was a servant leader too. A big influence for me serving in the army has, has probably been my family. I I had mentioned my dad, you know, retired from the army as a Lieutenant Colonel. He served in Vietnam. Um, My brother is an army orthopedic surgeon. He was a prior infantry uh, officer, ranger, switched over, went into medicine. He's a huge servant leader. My sister uh, was an army doctor for about 10 years, also a servant leader. My other brother served in the field artillery, 
stationed at Fort Sill, Oklahoma for uh, many years. Once uh, everybody in my family has deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan, service to our country. So, you know, without taking anyone for granted, everyone has, everyone around me in my life has served our country. And most importantly, my husband, Josh, has, you know, every step of the way, every day we're in this together. He's, he's been a helicopter pilot. He's uh, been there for soldiers at the point of injury, and he's continued in the army very successfully too. And so it's like the best people I worked for have been servant leaders. And I've studied servant leadership a lot too. Um, I've also studied it to just, you know, it, it it's the humility plus the ambition. There's a combination of, there's got to be a combination of humility, ambition. Mm-hmm. And another way, way to look at it is like, you know, taking care of people, but expecting high performance. If you're, if you're too far, uh, only focusing on people, but you don't care about results or too focused on results, but you kind of, you know, trample over people. There's got to be this balance between like love, essentially you love your people and you're, you want to win at the same time. You know, mm-hmm. you want, you're driven to win, but you have to love your people because your people will not help you win if they don't think that you care about them um, or love them, you right. know? And so that's just the healthiest combination right there. But but yeah, I think I strive to be a servant leader and I don't really see leadership in any other way other than that. And I, I've seen great results from that, you know, and again, it, it's, it's, it's this fine balance and it's easy to get too far in one direction or another. And I think where that, that's where that constant self-awareness and self-reflection has to keep entering the equation. It's this never ending journey of self-reflection and striving to be a servant leader. Um, and it's, and it's not easy, you know, if there's challenges all along the way with that. Um, but, do you yeah. do you have uh, so you mentioned people who you looked up to? Do you feel like yeah. you have had anybody who has really supported you um, and helped you develop as a leader or as a physician or both mm-hmm. that you would look back and say this person was a mentor to me over you know in my career? I would definitely say uh, probably those three individuals I mentioned already. I, uh, mm-hmm. It's funny because the my last I would say the last kind of favorite leader I worked for was the brigade commander, Colonel Hayden. And I was working at the Pentagon in my liaison role for the joint st- from the DHA to the joint staff surgeon. The joint staff surgeon's office was in the Pentagon. That's primarily where I worked. And it had been a couple years since I was in the brigade and I ran into my old boss, Colonel Hayden. And so I just was like, oh my gosh, here's like one of my favorite bosses I've ever had. And I'm just like running into him. And so I said, hey, would you meet me for a cup of coffee? And I basically asked him uh, for mentorship. And we probably met three or four different times over the course of a year. And I tried to just pick his brain. And we ended up talking a lot about like values-based leadership, like army values. And I just tried to ask him like, why are you, you know, why are you still in the army? Like, and literally like the one thing I took away from him is you could just tell he like loved it was because of he cares about people. And um, so again, I think servant leadership just comes back to you have to, there has to be that selfless servant mentality, which that's an army value, you know, selfless service, but there, there's gotta be a love there, you know, this, this love for a purpose greater than self. And you gotta love people. And you got to have this, you got to almost develop the art for achieving amazing results while loving the people around you, mm-hmm. you know? And so it's just, yeah, I don't know. I, I've done, I think done a lot of reading, you know, I think Josh mentors me a lot. My husband, mm. he's, he strives for servant leadership too. We talk about it a lot together. We've attended a lot of different like leadership seminars, leadership summits, and just trying to learn good through the good and through the bad that you experience every day, you know, just in the workplace. Do you see yourself fulfilling or filling a mentor role now to junior leaders? Yeah, I think I, I'm always seeking, um, seeking ways uh, to, to lift other people up. And um I would say like one of my goals, just even in this, the job I'm in now, I have, I have 10, about 10 people on my team 
and I'm, I'm pretty religious about um, meeting with each of them at least once every three months for our quarterly counseling um, and finding out what are their personal and professional goals and helping them achieve, achieve them. Um, there's also a couple other uh, army officers I've met along the way that I still keep in touch with and try to just be deliberate about reaching out to them periodically and setting up phone calls or checking in on them, uh, making sure they're doing good. Uh, I, I'm constantly looking for connecting with people and then just try to motivate people. So yeah, I, th I think it, for me, it's just part of a journey and um, it's something that I, I enjoy doing. And I think another thing about mentorship I've learned is how do you mentor in a 360 degree direction? Mm. So to be a three, 360 degree leader, like you, you start to realize you can mentor your leaders, you know, you can mentor your subordinates, you can mentor your peers. And I'm always looking for ways to, to try to just positively impact people that I work with, no matter at what level they are. But, uh, but yeah, I enjoy the mentorship part of it. What do you look for when you're evaluating your leaders? When you sit them down, you're doing your, your counseling, what is it you're looking for and what are you trying to push them towards? Um, I'm looking for, I would say a few things. Um, the humility, I think the hum there's something about the, the trait of humility, like the selfless aspect, realizing that we're here for a purpose greater than self. So I try to connect with people that, you know, number one, we're all here, especially in the army, you know, uh, we're all here for a purpose that's greater than ourselves. And we're all connected by that, whether we realize it or, or not. And then the army, it's defending our nation's freedom. So no matter what we do, if we're a doctor or a pilot or a logistician, you know, we're all here for that purpose. So that kind of just, that just puts us all on the same level right away. You know, one job's not more important than the other. Um, but, I, but I'm looking for that, that sense of humility that, that the team is more important than the individual and that there's a bigger mission here that we're, that we have a privilege to be a part of. And so I try to like, just talk a little bit about that and mentor that and, um, and kind of ask questions related to that, I would say, so that there's that. And then the, the ambition part is what are your goals? How can I help you achieve them? Here's the team goals. Here's the mission goals. Here's how you fit into that. Um, but it's, 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 uh, awesome to work with teammates that that have those characteristics they're they're already humble they're hard working and and then i think that last part is just to be a fantastic teammate uh you know to be a fantastic teammate to to try to help build the team get along with people you got to be good with people that interpersonal dynamic is so important um and so people that just have those characteristics already you, it's just a win you know but uh i always try to incorporate those things i think into any kind of mentorship or counseling that i do with people and i, I think about those for myself too like am i a fantastic teammate am i being a great teammate number one you know am i staying selfless and humble keep connecting myself to the greater purpose here the greater mission that's way bigger than just me you know what i what i want for myself and then um, um, you know, am I staying focused on the main thing or, or what are our goals? Keep reassessing our goals and what are we actually trying to achieve? And then are we achieving it? Because especially in the army, you know, we got to win. We're here. We're playing to win in the army. And I think in life, too, it's just how do we keep getting better? So I know you and Josh both do a lot of reading. You've talked uh, about leadership. Is there a book that you would recommend to early careers, young officers or young young folks who are just launching their careers in, in leadership roles in healthcare. Is there something you would rec a book you would recommend? Yeah. I, I think one of my favorite books has been um, start with why by S Simon Sinek. Oh, very good. And I read that book probably back in 2010 or something, but um, yeah, that book, I would recommend it to every leader just because uh, you know, it's important to understand why you do what you do. I think a lot of times uh, when you're starting out in anything, you, you know what to do and how to do it. But if you don't understand why you're doing it, you know, the deeper purpose above self. And um, when things get hard, 
for me, at least when things have gotten challenging or things have gotten hard, I always come back to my purpose. Like, why am I doing this? And, and I think that's kept me going in the army. You know, why, why am I still wearing this uniform? I could go be a doctor anywhere and just kind of call it quits in the army, but it all comes back to the purpose greater than self. I'm here to help defend our nation's freedom and take care of, of the war fighters and the soldiers and their families who are the ones doing the hard work to defend our nation's freedom. So it's just his message in that book, I think kind of keeps you going um, and helps you develop that passion for, for why, you know, why medicine, why be a physician, uh, you know, cause being a physician is, is not easy. It's, it's a hard job. And uh, I always tell people too, you know, medicine is one of those professions where there's no finish line because people are always going to get sick. People are always going to get injured and um, you can, you never cross the finish line in medicine. It's just this long journey, this lifelong journey that you just kind of keep going and you, and it's, you have to have endurance. And when things get hard, I think to come back to your bigger purpose keeps you going. Endurance seems to be a theme in your life, starting all the way back with cross country up till. Uh... I think so too. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh yeah. So, so in conclusion, um, for a young person who's thinking about a career maybe in healthcare, why should uh -huh. they think about military medicine? Well, military medicine is unique. Um, it's a it's a service oriented oriented profession. You're in a you're a, in a way you're a dual servant because you're serving your country as an army officer or a military officer and you're serving patients as a healthcare professional. Um, it, uh, it's a way to get a free education, you know, <laughs> at, at, the, at the heart of it right there is a lot yeah. of people go into the military because it's uh, you'll come out of medical school or dental school or whatever kind of professional school debt free or I mean, uh, yeah, with no debt. So I, I graduated medical school kind of owing zero dollars, you know, and, and if anything, they, they give you a bonus and you, they give you a stipend. So it's a job you're making money going through medical school there. And uh, also another reason people can think about going into military medicine is, especially if you have a sense of adventure or like to travel, is that um, the military is all over the world. And so it's truly... Uh, a healthcare mission that exists in every single part of the world, in every continent. Um, we're training and working and stationed in so many different countries. Um, and it's truly a global healthcare mission. I think that's another reason why I have really stayed with it and appreciated um, being in the military for a while is just as you get to work in so many different places. Another Another reason why um, military medicine is a great profession, too, is just we have the best patient population in the world. So we're taking care of our nation's finest. We're taking care of young men and women, families who are all serving our country. And that, that in itself is just such a great honor. But yeah, I would just say, ultimately, it's a, if you're looking to go into a profession of service, there's no better way to then spend a little time uh, serving our country in the military. There's so many people that um, come in and, and do their three years or their four years or five years and they serve their country and then they step aside and they go on and they serve their community and um, in so many other ways. And, uh, but I, I think one thing um, maybe that's just important for young people to know too, is our soldiers essentially are laying down their life for our nation's freedom. And every single one of us who's volunteered to raise our right hand in support of our nation's freedom, there's an element of sacrifice there that sometimes we take for granted or we don't think about. But um, one, of the, one of the reasons why I think I stayed in the Army was when I first started back at uh, Madigan in my, my residency and I was a brand new Army officer, I had heard of a soldier who had um, died during combat and um, had received the Medal of Honor. And that was a, a guy named Specialist Ross McGinnis from Pennsylvania, a 19 year old young man, had everything going for him, but was in a combat environment where, you know, things were not going well and a grenade was thrown and he was with his team. And he, in a, in a split second, decided to use his body to cover the grenade to protect uh, everybody else on his team. And, um, 
he ended up receiving the Medal of Honor for that in the early 2000s. And uh, when we were stationed in Washington, D.C., uh, my husband and I, and we took our kids, and many times I just went by myself, but we would go to visit him at his grave site in Arlington and just stand there because, it, you know, it's just unfathomable and uh, incredible that a 19-year-old person would do that for our country and for his brothers in arms. And um, as I continue to serve soldiers in the Army, many of them who are 19 years old, I, I always think about, I always think about Ross and I always think about, gosh, it's such an honor to take care of these young men and women. Uh, we've got the best patient population in the world um, because I just realized what soldiers, uh, their purpose truly is, you know, in defense of our nation and how incredible that is and how dangerous that can be and how brave they have to be in just doing their job. So it's, it's a real honor just to take care of soldiers. Yeah, I think it's just maybe one of the greatest things that we'll do in our lifetimes. You know, whether you serve four years or 20 years, it's just, uh, it's it's an honorable uh, path to take for a little while. And I think you realize that, you realize that more as you get to the end of it and you can yeah. look back and, and it's not always easy and there's a lot of sacrifice, but uh, it's, it's a remarkable uh, place to spend some of our time for a while serving, you know. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Amy. It's been great catching up again and, and hearing hearing uh, hearing about your adventure since we last talked back in San Antonio. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. You've been listening to The Health Leader Forge, a joint production of the College of Health and Human Services at the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. Please go to our website, healthleaderforge.org, for more information or to leave comments about today's podcast, look for Health Leader Forge podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and other podcast distribution sites. Thanks for being a part of the Health Leader Forge community, and we'll talk with you again soon. <laughs>